yeah, make sure that you mute when you're not speaking if you could. Um, but also like if you, if folks are talking too fast, if you need somebody to repeat something or slow down or define something, like please let us know um, so that we can, we can make sure to do that. Um, and then in terms of agenda or run of show, what we'll be doing, um, myself and Tracy will kick us off to talk about like the frame and analysis um, that we hold around policing and finance at Acre. Um, Jessica will give us an overview on bonds. Carrie will actually walk us through a bond document and then Tracy and I will wrap, wrap up talking about Acre's recommendations and then we'll close out. Um, so I'm really excited. I hope y'all can hang with us. I think we've got about 90 minutes scheduled for this. Um, so lots of good information and part of this is a training. Um, okay, uh, so I will just jump right in. So Acre's work is focused on exposing the ways that Wall Street has expanded into our everyday lives, making things less affordable for us and more profitable for them. Uh, we know that their tools also like don't, don't just like happen to impact communities of color. We believe that, that Wall Street targets communities of color with their tools of debt and high price services um, because of like our history of economic insecurity. Um, and so today and for like the whole of this series, we'll be looking at the relationships um, between Wall Street, corporations, and local police departments. Um, and so like three years ago, when we started this research um, on police brutality bonds, and even two years ago, when the report was first published, our analysis as an organization on policing and finance, or even like policing capitalism, really wasn't where it is today. Um, it's been a really like generative two years um, and we've really used this time to like develop our analysis, um, build it out, and, and we'll talk more about like how things have, have shifted and changed and expanded like throughout this training and when we get to the, to the recommendation section. Um, so PBBs or police brutality bonds more specifically. Um, these happen when a city decides to borrow to pay for police brutality settlements. And in the process of that borrowing, uh, banks can make an immediate profit um, and investors will make a profit over time. So um, we see this like very specifically as Wall Street profiting from police violence. And like we recognized how awful this was from the jump. Um, and as we've talked more about it and done more learning about other aspects of policing and finance, we really began to like expand our understanding of the relationships between these two institutions. Um, which is how we got here. And so you'll see on this slide, there are some um, images that I think really help to, to reinforce like that police are the muscle of racial capitalism. And, um, you know, I just wanna like pause and like cite the Black Panther Party. Uh, that is where I first like got this visual and analogy of police being the muscle. And it really has um, helped me to understand like the relationship of of police to, <laughs> to upholding all of like these different systems of oppression. And so we know that police only serve to protect the interests of the wealthy, again, making their lives more comfortable at the expense of our lives and our resources. Um, that looks like cops in schools, uh, more money for cops and less money for our public schools. It looks like sheriffs being the ones to, to carry out evictions from housing. Um, and you can see that like represented in this image that is on the far right. This is um, art by Emery Douglas, who was a Black Panther. Um, and in this, it's this, this Black woman is making a statement about police officers coming to her door to tell her to pay her rent, right? Like that is, that, that is an example again of police being here to protect property, um, to protect the interests of landlords and the interests of corporations. Uh, another example, um, the National Guard being sent in to protect property after the uprisings around the U.S. or the tech industry making billions of dollars off of creating and contracting out surveillance equipment. Um, most recently, we saw, we're seeing like a standoff between Native peoples and police or law enforcement at Mount Rushmore. Um, the history of like the displacement of, of Native Americans and Indigenous people to like these 
to North America, right? Like that is that is police protecting the interests of the wealthy. Um, that is like these are all examples of historically marginalized communities being segregated, oppressed, corralled, controlled, so that like the wealthy can continue to make their profit, expand their businesses, force us into debt, take money away from our public services. Um, it really has been like keep the poor over there, keep the black people, keep the brown people over there um, and do it with violence so that we can continue to, to pad our pockets. Um, so that, uh, <laughs> that very heavy overview is like our analysis um, around the relationship between police and finance. You know, ultimately we know like the wealthy class wants to keep making their money um, and they need us to be controlled um, in order to do so. So uh, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Tracy to dig more into how this relates to our current moment. Thank you so much for that, Alex. Um, so I just want to start by saying it's amazing to be living in a time where there are mainstream conversations and demands about defunding and abolishing the police. So I want everybody on the webinar to like take that moment in um, and take in your place in this moment. And, and when we're talking about redistributing money into the things that our community want and need. And right, and most commonly that's been called an invest-divest framework. You may be familiar with that from the past few years. Um, but most, but typically we see invest-divest as a, sorry, we see invest-divest um, as this one-to-one. -one. So we have to think bigger than that. And what I mean by one-to-one -one is we say we're going to divest $30 million from policing. And when we do that, we're going to invest that $30 million into communities. And what we're saying is, yes, we should totally do that. <laughs> and we should also figure out what else our communities need. So if our communities need $60 million, let's do that $30 million divestment and let's go get that other, um, that other 30 that our communities need. Um, and so that's why we believe we must expose and cut relationships between, between police and the finance industry and police and corporations, because that money is our money too. Um, we talk more about those relationships throughout this webinar seri series, but today our focus is on police brutality bonds. So police brutality bonds have created a way for investors of the finance industry to profit from police violence, also for police officers in their cities to avoid accountability for police violence, and creates this cycle that keeps our communities from being invested in. For many reasons, including, uh, including police brutality bonds, Wall Street has an interest in keeping police on our streets. And so when we say defund the police, we must also be naming the institutions that support police as well to ensure that we are addressing and tearing down the whole system. So we have to be doing both at the same time. I also want to say that addressing police brutality is not just a budgeting issue. It's a moral one. And so we don't want that to get lost. Today in this report, we're highlighting how far municipalities are going um, and are willing to go to hide who profits from police violence. But we're not suggesting that victims should not be paid for the violence they suffer. We are asserting that that type of predatory silencing will exist as long as the systems of, a system of police exists. exist. So we stand firmly with the uh, demand to defund police, and we see an understanding, we see understanding the system as an integral part of doing that defund work. So now I'm going to turn it over uh, to Carrie and to Jessica um, to talk, uh, to get more into the ways that bonds come to be and what we can do about them. Okay, thank you for that, Tracy. Hi, everyone. My name is Jessica. Um, so we thought that before we could explain in more detail what police brutality bonds are, um, we thought it'd be most valuable to just talk about um, bonds in general, just to make sure we're all on the same page with that. Next slide, please. So an easy way to think about municipal bonds is kind of like they work like mortgages, where when a city or a county wants to build a new airport or build or maintain a bridge or a library, that costs a lot of money up front, much like how 
as someone who's looking to own a home um, comes across a home that say it costs a quarter of a million dollars, not a ton of people have that much money in cash. So what homeowners would, would potential homeowners would like to do is take out that money to help spread the cost over time. So municipal bonds work much the same way. These are critical pieces of infrastructure that cities and counties know they're going to be using for a long time. And so it makes sense to spread the cost over the amount of time that they'd probably be using that infrastructure. Next slide, please. So just a little overview of how a mortgage works. So say you're the homeowner on the left, there's the bank on the right, there's the house above. Um, you need $200 in cash to pay for the house. So you will enter into an agreement with the bank where they will front you that $200,000 in cash. And over time, you'll pay back the bank um, in chunks, paying off the principal, which is that $200,000 in cash, plus interest. And interest is, of course, the ways that banks make money off of mortgages. Next slide, please. So municipal bonds work much the same way. Um, we're going to go through this example bond where, say, a city or county wants to take out $100 million um, because they want to maintain a bridge that they've built. Um, and this $100 million will be, so the city or county will do what they call issue debt, which means they'll issue $5,000 chunks that equal $100 million um, in principle. And sometimes bonds can have around a 5% interest, although it could be more or less, depending on what the credit rating of the city or county is. And usually it's going to be around uh, over the period of 30 years they have to pay that back. And again, that could be more or less depending on the structure of the bond. Next slide, please. So how does the government get the money from bondholders? So on the right, we see um, there's a bondholder or an investor. In this case, we're going to go with BlackRock. BlackRock is the largest global asset manager, um, and they buy up a lot of municipal bonds um, on behalf of their investors. Um, so this is, this is big business for them is, is municipal bonds. Um, so what BlackRock will do is they'll buy those $5,000 chunks. That chunk of money will go through this bank in the middle that acts as kind of a mediator called an underwriter. And that bank will then give that money to, back to the government so that they can pay for the projects that they're trying to finance. And in return for the underwriter kind of like helping to mediate this transaction, the underwriter, of course, needs to get a cut of the action. So they will charge fees from the government. So that's where the profit comes from there. Next slide, please. Okay, so the government has the money. How do they pay it back over time? So they will pay back those $5,000 chunks um, that the investors uh, gave before, um, also in installments, what we call the principal. And a third um, financial institution comes into the picture named a trustee bank. And they, are, again, act as an intermediary between the bondholders and the government again, collecting fees for even handling the money at all. And then also, of course, the bondholders get to collect that 5% interest from the government. So this is, so yeah, the role that financial institutions have in both governments borrowing and paying back that money um, is what we like to characterize as financialization, where Wall Street firms and finance firms find ways to insert themselves into transactions where, you know, governments, are in critical need of financing essential public goods and services. And um, Wall Street finds a way to kind of get, find a role um, in those transactions so that they can cut a profit for themselves. So next slide, please. Okay, I'll just actually pause there in case there are any questions about what bonds are. Do we have any questions to you? Okay. Well, a couple of questions. So, One oh, question. Yep. Saying, um, is it a problem that municipal bonds are usually tax exempt, thus of benefit primarily to the very wealthy? Another question asking, um, the $5,000 chunk part confuses me. Who holds those chunks? Is BlackRock only one of many companies who are holding a small chunk? Okay, those are both great questions. Um, I can feel the second one, Carrie, if you could tag team me on the, on the first one, is that okay? Yeah. 
Okay, great. So the second one, that's a great question. You're absolutely right. There are tons of investors that um, buy these $5,000 chunks. Um, the idea being that it might be harder to get just like one, one firm to buy up all $100 million and, and loan that out. So um, usually for a bond, there could be dozens of different investors and firms that are involved. And some of those investment firms represent even more investors that are putting money into a fund. And then that firm is able to then buy municipal bonds and what have you. Um, so yeah, so BlackRock is like definitely a, a pretty big investor in municipal bonds, Fidelity, Vanguard, kind of like the largest um, kind of investment firms you could think of, they, in, they uh, partake in investing in municipal bonds. And also there could be, um, sometimes these firms can represent pension funds or very wealthy individuals who will buy into funds that then um, buy up bonds. Um, so I'll, I'll answer the question about the tax exemption. So municipal bonds, um, many of them are tax exempt, which makes them very attractive to investors um, who have the money for the $5,000 chunk or who invested in a fund that buys the bonds. Um, but I want to point out that the bonds that are paying for police settlements and judgments are generally not tax exempt. They are usually taxable bonds. Um, and that's, that also makes them more expensive because if an investor is buying a bond that they have to pay tax on, uh, they're, ex they're expecting a higher interest rate. Great. Thank you, Carrie. Okay, and then okay. a couple more questions for you, Jessica. One is asking if you can um, repeat the point that you made about financialization and um, how they're inserting themselves into these interactions. And a question mm -hmm. about what is the transaction called? Okay, um, I think I understand the first part of the question. I'm not totally sure I understand the second part of the question, but let's see if I end up answering it. Um, so yeah, happy to kind of run that back. Um, so say you're a government and you're like, you know what, we have a lot of folks that live in this area or folks that need to access our area. We really want to build an airport. It's like pretty essential that we build this airport so that folks can get around and, and we can be accessible. This is a piece of very crit critical infrastructure where basically a city will probably pay whatever it needs in order to get that airport built, right? Um, so this is, a, this is a city that's definitely in need. Um, so I feel like the, you know, what would be fairest to taxpayers would be, well, we need this airport to be built because we need our people to be able to move around. Um, so ideally, what, what would be great is if they could loan that money for nothing um, so that, uh, you know, the world can keep moving and, and what have you. Um, but in this need, rather than, um, you know, the government or financial institution stepping in saying like, yes, we will help you out. Um, Wall Street comes in and say, we're going to help you out, but we're going to take a little cut because, I mean, we're providing an essential service too, right? Like we need to get ours. Um, so they will charge a fee for being able to help out these governments that need this critical infrastructure. And we at Acre feel that this, it's this kind of dynamic where Wall Street sees an opportunity to create, to create a profit for themselves not really regarding why that money is needed and like who that money will help to serve best. Um, they just simply see it as a property, as, as a profit opportunity. Um, and so they will figure out a way to build in a, a profit, a profit creating mechanism for themselves in that. So um, other folks on this call also have expertise in financialization, how we define it. So if anyone else wants to hop in, please do so. Um, so yeah, I'll just pause there. Thanks, Jessica. So what we're going to do is move forward just um, because of the time for the program. Um, and also for all participants, um, we're going to also be having a follow-up training um, that you'll have more information for after this webinar. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you, Tia, keeping us on task. And thanks for your great questions so far. So now that we have a basic understanding of how bonds work, what are police brutality bonds? Um, with the recent uprising following the murder of George Floyd, we've seen um, that our research has gotten a lot of circulation and folks are asking us more about police brutality bonds, so let's get into it. Next slide, please. So police brutality bonds work much the same way <clears throat> as we were referring to before, but instead of cities and counties using bonds to help pay for 
long-term investments that um, that will uh, that they can spread that cost over time. Um, police brutality bonds help pay for settlements and judgments that come as the result of police misconduct and police violence. So, you know, a police officer gets sued, the county or city is like, okay, well, shoot, now we have need to pay for this litigation and also pay for the damages that this police officer is responsible for. So what they'll do is they'll issue debt um, to help pay for those settlements and judgments. Sometimes they'll kind of bundle a bunch of settlements together, sometimes along with other costs that they want to help finance via bonds, and then they'll issue that debt. And much like in the previous slide, they, um, you know, different bondholders like BlackRock, Vanguard, et cetera, et cetera, will then buy up those, um, those chunks of cash and then lend it out and, uh, so that they can get an interest, uh, collect the interest um, as they return on the, the principal. Next slide, please. So a key question here that um, we, we try to raise in our report is why do cities need to borrow money at all to pay for these settlements? Um, and we really want to be able to highlight that for cities and counties to be turning to bonds to help pay for the misconduct and illegal activity of the police um, is a political choice. It's a political choice because, you know, governments don't have enough um, cash reserves in order to pay for, or they're not willing to pay for these settlements and judgments out of their cash and operating budgets. So they want to turn to um, issuing debt instead. But if we kind of bring that back a step further, why, are gov why do governments have such a small pot um, of cash anyway? And that comes from the choice and the lack of a political will to tax the wealthy their fair share. So if governments and counties actually had the political will um, to be able to collect what's fair um, for the people who can afford it most um, in, in these communities uh, to help the government have enough resources to pay for the things that are essential to operate, then they wouldn't have to be issuing this debt. But because of you know, austerity politics and, and other kinds of dynamics, um, and, and kind of there's a, a strong narrative on the right of wanting that like debt is bad, uh, I'm sorry, the taxes are bad, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is what leads to austerity budgets and why there's so much lending for these types of costs. Um, and again, as Tracy mentioned earlier in the webinar, you know, these families absolutely deserve these settlements. Absolutely. I mean, they, they definitely need to have um, the damages uh, and harm inflicted upon them acknowledged in some way. Um, and so we're not saying they don't deserve that, but it's that we really want to investigate um, all of the ways in which the governments are choosing to pay for these costs. Um, and in the process, uh, Wall Street is making a profit off of this debt. Next slide, please. And so a bigger question um, that kind of gets at what Tracy and Alex were laying out in the beginning is, well, why do we have to pay for this police misconduct at all? Um, if police were actually acting according to the way they're supposed to act, they wouldn't have um, these settlements and judgments that governments then need to cover, um, which kind of drives home, home the point more that the total cost of policing is actually astronomical. Already, what's very clear if you look at different municipal budgets is that Police budgets can take up 40, 50% of the entire operating budget, but that's just one cost that's captured in the budget. There are all these other costs like police brutality bonds that are actually extremely difficult to really come across and be able to understand like how much both governments are costing taxpayers like for um, the misconduct of police and also how Wall Street then is able to make a profit off of that misconduct. So, um, knowing that police departments can be so wasteful um, and violent, uh, it makes a lot of sense then to defund the police and be able to fund critical services and goods for cities and counties like education, like healthcare, like public transportation, like housing, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide, please. Okay, so before we get into the results of the report, actually, I just want to pause in case there are any other questions if we had time for them on what police brutality bonds are. No, there are no questions uh, related to what you're sharing. Okay, great. So, um, big thanks to Carrie and to Alex for uh, leading the research that we initially did on uh, police brutality bonds. Right here, we've published or republished um, 
the results of their analysis from a couple years ago. Um, and so we'll see that here we listed up Chicago, Cleveland, Lake County, Los Angeles and Milwaukee as like some places where um, we were able to find that police brutality bonds do exist. Um, and so, you know, we'll see the total cost of how much these bonds were for. That, that's the principle that I was talking about earlier. Um, and the second column, which I think is the most interesting, is how much interest those bonds ended up costing uh, taxpayers over time. So, you know, as if you recall, like there in the example of the municipal bond, we had like a 5% interest rate. Um, that's assuming that uh, the city or county has a certain credit rating. Um, you'll see that Chicago has an astronomical amount of interest that, in, that taxpayers are paying to investors because of these police brutality bonds, so much so that it's more than how much they actually needed to borrow to pay for these settlements and judgments. Um, and both of these numbers are very high. They're almost a, a billion dollars each. Um, and so the reason why that interest is so high for Chicago is that Chicago had a very, very poor credit rating. It was even, some of the bonds were even downgraded to junk, which is the lowest of the low. So that's why so much interest is being collected by investors in Wall Street um, on these bonds. And so here's a really good example of what we were referring to before of financialization in the ways that Wall Street is able to exploit municipalities and cities who are in need of critical infrastructure um, and other critical costs um, by basically just keeping on raising the interest rate um, because they want to profit for taking on that risk. So we'll see that for Chicago, taxpayers over this seven year period paid over $1.5 billion on police brutality bonds. Okay, so, and this is, this is by, by no means an exhaustive list of all of the places that had police brutality bonds in the, um, the time span we're looking at from 2008 to 2017. Um, I'll defer to Carrie to talk a little bit more about what that research process was like. Um, but it just, again, highlights how, how truly opaque these bonds are and how it's really difficult for, for, uh, for anyone to understand how much cities and counties are actually spending on our police departments and also how much Wall Street is profiting off of that. Okay, and with that, I'll hand it over to Carrie to walk us through uh, what the research looks like. Thanks, Jess. Um, I just want to say uh, sorry to everyone who's asking questions that we can't get to. Um, some of the questions people are asking are answered by the report itself, so I encourage everyone to follow the link that Alex dropped to the report. Also, though, as Tia said, we're doing a sort of follow-up to this that's going to get into more detail on bonds on September 2nd, so stay tuned for that. Um, one question I do want to address before I move into the researchy piece is um, a question about you know why are bonds attractive investments why are municipal bonds attractive investments um, generally people think that municipal bonds are really safe investments um, so the interest might be less than you might get on a riskier investment but <clears throat> um, generally people think that the money's going to be there because the the governments that issue bonds have the power to tax they have the power to raise the revenue to pay the bonds back. And this is a really important point when we're thinking about budget priorities because um, the, the money that governments owe to the bondholders is not considered like discretionary or optional. Uh, governments are legally required to pay that money back. They're not legally required to make sure that communities have you know, um, a mental health clinic or enough schools. Um, so that's an important thing to consider. Um, and also I wanna say that we're not saying that all municipal bonds are bad. Like it often makes sense to borrow money to build a school, but it also, we also are seeing that uh, governments are, are having to rely on borrowing because of the revenue problems that we were talking about earlier. Okay, so getting into the research. Um, researching police brutality bonds can be really challenging because of a lack of transparency and disclosure from cities and counties. Um, and one thing that we kept running into as we're doing this research is that often cities will issue a big chunk of bonds and just a portion is going to settlements and judgments. So for example, Chicago issued a billion dollar bond and they set aside 225 million for settlements and judgments. 
And added to that, we don't know for sure. We, we know that there's 225 million for settlements and judgments. We don't know how much of that specifically is going to police related settlements and judgments. So um, this is a research challenge that we had to deal with as we were doing the, the research. On the other hand, sometimes cities issue bonds that are dedicated just to paying for settlements and judgments. And these are often called judgment obligation bonds or final judgment bonds or some, some version of that. Um, that can make the research a lot easier, but even then, it's not always clear how much of uh, those bonds are going to police-related settlements in particular, because again, cities have other legal costs, other settlement costs that they are sometimes um, paying for with borrowing. This was true in our research for the Lake County case study and also for the Cleveland case studies. So because there's such a range in how cities do things, we had to tailor our research approach for each case study based on what was available to us, what information was avail avail available to us. Um, so we're gonna talk about our general research approach and then dig in a little on our Lake County case study. And we're going to show you um, a source that we used for that. Next slide, please. So in general, um, we had a couple of key approaches for doing this research. One, we had a FOIA strategy for those who aren't familiar with FOIAs. FOIA is the Freedom of Information Act. It allows people to request access to information from government bodies. We sent information requests to a lot of cities. Um, we chose cities that we knew had, uh, that were under investigation by the Department of Justice um, or under a consent decree with the Department of Justice. Other cities we knew had a lot of settlements or a lot of police violence, cities that we knew were struggling financially. Um, the FOIA strategy didn't actually get us a lot of useful information. In some cases, we ran up against governments just not wanting to comply with our information request. Um, sometimes we did feel confident that the city just wasn't issuing bonds to pay for police settlements and judgments. Um, sometimes we're, it wasn't clear whether they were or not. Another approach that we used was doing simple news searches to find stories that mentioned large um, police-related settlements and borrowing. So there are a fair number of stories about particular settlements where the reporters mention that the city was going to borrow to pay for the settlement. Anytime we found a story about borrowing in a particular place, we would dig in to see if we could find more about that city. And when we dug in, we used a wide variety of sources, including, um, and this again depended on what was available from the city or the county, but uh, sometimes we're able to, to find uh, city council documents um, where they authorized borrowing to pay for a settlement, other city financial documents. And we looked at a lot of something called a, an official statement a bond official statement. So um, whenever a government issues a bond, uh, they have to put something together for investors, a lot of information that they're legally required to disclose to anyone who might be interested in buying the bond. Um, so we're gonna get into more detail about that when we discuss the Lake County case study and we're gonna actually look at part of a, an official statement. But those can be really rich sources of data. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the, an example of the kind of story that you might find if you're looking for reporting on borrowing for settlements. Lake County, Indiana, um, at this point, uh, was issuing an $8.2 million bond for um, <coughs> settlements, <coughs> excuse me, related to their uh, jail, the county jail. Lake County is the only county in our case studies, although we do have other examples of county borrowing in the report. Um, we, we think because we didn't focus a whole lot on counties, there's probably a lot of other counties out there doing this that we haven't come, that we haven't researched yet. Um, counties are where you find cases, of course, involving jails and sheriff's departments more generally. So this story mentioned that the jail had reached a settlement with the Department of Justice over conditions in the jail a few years before. So anytime there's a Department of Justice investigation, uh, you know that things are especially bad there. So uh, the Department of Justice had 
uh, sued the county over things like a lack of medical care in the jail. Um, so we we looked for additional news stories about Lake County and we found a few. So the next step here was then actually pulling up the official statements on the bonds. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, Emma is a uh, database that is uh, maintained by the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board, and it is a very good place to look for bond official statements. You can register to use it for free, and then you can start looking. Um, the bond documents that you find there can be really good sources of information about not just this particular bond issuance, but the city's finances in general. Um, and again, we're gonna do this training in September, but if you're very curious about and you want some tips on using Emma to find bond documents, we do have a guide that we can send uh, you. Just contact us after this. We'll send that to you. Okay, so next slide, please. What are you gonna find in an official statement? Um, in almost all official statements, you're going to find the information about who the underwriter is. And sometimes there's more than one bank as that's listed as an underwriter, but on the very first page of an official statement, you are almost always going to see the underwriting bank. Uh, you can also find out about other banks that are getting paid for this deal. Um, <clears throat> and you're going to find out how much the bond is for, you know, how much the government is borrowing, um, the interest rate they're paying, and the schedule for paying off the bonds. You are also going to find something called the cost of issuance, which is um, generally it is the, what the underwriter is getting paid and then it also includes some other things, anything from you know, some sort of legal costs of putting the deal together, even you know, the cost of printing out the documents, but about half of that goes to the underwriter. Um, you're going to find out what the money will pay for. This can be very specific in some bond official statements. It can also be very general and vague, depending on the statement. <clears throat> and then you're gonna find out how the, what the source of the, the money is to pay the bonds back, um, the principal and the interest. So this might be um, taxes, it might be property taxes, like in the case of Chicago, a lot, of uh, people's property taxes are going to pay back the bonds. Um, it could be sales taxes, it could be some kind of fee, it just depends on the bond. But that should be very clearly laid out in the official statement. Um, what we found when we looked at Lake County's bond official statements was that Lake County issues judgment funding bonds, um, bonds again dedicated solely to paying for settlements and judgments, Los Angeles with the other city in our case studies that did this. Um, you can actually go into the EMMA database and look for judgment bonds, and you'll see a whole bunch of uh, bonds popping up. Those are not all going to be police related. They're paying for lots of different things, but you can do that and find judgment bonds that way. Um, okay, so now we are going to actually look at um, one of the bonds OSs. Okay, so what you're looking at here is um, Lake County bond for $8.25 million, which is what that news story was about. And you can see in the very sort of center top, it tells you how much the bond is for, and it has, it tells you sort of what the bond is called. So judgment funding bonds of 2018. And then if you scroll down a little, a um, little bit more to the very bottom of this page, you can see uh, the, the financial firm, that's the underwriter. So center bottom page is generally where you're going to find the underwriter information. This is gonna look different on different bonds depending on how many banks are involved. Um, 
but you know, and we we found lots of different financial firms here. Sometimes they were local firms. Sometimes it was Goldman Sachs or Bank of America. Um, you know, it's basically, if <laughs> uh, Wall Street is there, and all of these kinds of bonds. And then, um, so this is, a, I edited this document so that we wouldn't have to be scrolling through pages and pages. These, these are very long documents generally. So what you're gonna see next is an appendix page. It's, that you would not see this on the second page of a bond document. But this was the research bonanza that we found in these official statements. So what you're looking at is each of the cases that uh, resulted in a settlement or judgment that these bonds are paying for. You have the case number over on the right, you can see the settlement amount. So you can see you know, one, one of them was 2.3 million, um, for 435,000, et cetera. So um, this was great. This gives us a ton of data to work with, but it's not enough because just from looking at this, we don't know what these cases are about. And again, like I said earlier, some of them are, we can assume are gonna be police cases, uh, policing related cases. Some of them may not be. So our next step was to actually go dig up these particular cases and find out what they were about. So we looked up each and every one of these cases, or we tried to, we found most of them. Um, some of them we weren't able to nail down exactly what they were. Um, we found four of these such bonds for Lake County in the period of time we were looking at. So between 2008 and 2018, um, we found four of these bonds, judgment obligation bonds or judgment bonds for a total of $18.1 million. And we just started adding up every time we confirmed that something was related to the sheriff's department or the jail, we started adding those figures up. And we ended up with a figure of 11.8 million, which we think may be a conservative estimate given that we couldn't quite nail down what some of those cases were about. And I wanna point out also that Lake County issued more judgment bonds in 2019, another 4.4 million. Yeah, you can see more of the cases there. Okay. Um, any questions? about this stuff. A couple of questions for you, Carrie. One is about um, how easy is it to pick out the bonds that are issued explicitly for these types of settlements? There's a couple of questions about why it's so hard to discern and um, how, do you, how can you figure out what bonds are for? Uh, yeah, so why is it so hard? So I can, I can say a little about Chicago is an example of a place where it was really difficult. Um, so I mentioned earlier that Chicago issued, in 2017 they issued, I think it was a billion dollars worth of bonds. There was a chunk of it um, that they identified in the OS as being for settlements and judgments, 225 million, but we didn't know if, what cases those were for. Alex actually did, so I don't know, Alex, if you want to jump in, Alex did a lot of this research. Um, it turns out that Chicago was issuing these bonds, and so they, the $225 million chunk that they were going to pay for settlements and judgments, and putting it into a fund, there was other sources of revenue going into that fund, and that fund was paying for a lot of different things. So Chicago was not even actually keeping track of where the money specifically was coming from for particular settlements. So um, Chicago, Chicago was an enormous research challenge. Um, I know Alex, Alex and I both, I think, uh, spent quite a bit of time just sort of just trying to find additional information that we could use to kind of cross, cross reference with the bonds. So that's one example of how difficult it might be. Um, in general, so like I said, you can, if you're looking at a bond document, there's generally a page that has, it's, it's called like sources and uses or something like that. And it'll tell you um, generally what the bonds are for. Some official statements get, like I said earlier, very specific. Like they'll say, 
you know, this is going to build the, a school or, you know, whatever it is. Some of them are more, are, Chicago's tend to be very general. There's like a paragraph of things that it, they might use it for. They give themselves a lot of room. So it really just depends. Thank you. And then another similar type of question is, um, people asking questions about how do we know do cities borrow, use these bonds, use borrow bonds or issue bonds just for brutality settlement? Or are there other types of costs factored in like retaining counsel or legal fees or other things like that? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Uh, generally, if the bond says that it's paying for um, settlements and judgments, it doesn't specify if that also includes legal costs. Um, we know that Chicago, it, when they take that big chunk of money from a bond and put it in the fund that they use, they are using it for uh, legal costs as well. And we know that because of other documents that we found that confirm that. So I think it depends on the, the government that you're looking at. Um, I also want to address a question that Sokov actually posed um, in the chat, will all official statements have this kind of an appendix? Absolutely not. I do want to emphasize um, <laughs> uh, some official statements that we looked at had uh, something like this, like a, some kind of description of the particular cases. Most official statements that we looked at did not. And then there's a several questions about the Emma database and how do you get an account and what the guide that you referred to? Yeah, so Emma, you can go to um, the Emma website. It is, I think it's like emma.msrb. Anyway, you can, you can probably Google it. You can find the Emma website. All you need to do is register. What was that? Alex shared the link to it in the chat. Oh, perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, so you can register, it's free registration, um, your name and your email address and stuff like that. And then once you're registered, and you have to agree that you, to their terms of use of the website, and then you're in. Um, the guide that we have, again, if you send an email, we have contact information at the end, we'll share the contact information. And if you want the guide to using Emma to doing bond research, we will email that to you if you email us and ask for it. The other thing I'll say based on an exchange I'm seeing in the chat is that sometimes the bond OSs are scanned and so the control F won't necessarily work very well. So you might have to uh, convert it to a Word document or whatever you usually do to um, look through a scan document. But yeah, you can, you can do a control F and find, you don't, you don't wanna have to look at every single page um, necessarily of the OS to find some of the key information you're looking for, like what it's paying for. So you can search for those things. Sources and uses is a good thing to search for. One more question um, that a couple of people have asked is, <laughs> do cities issue bonds kind of proactively, like, oh, they know that they're going to have to borrow money? Are, are bonds usually issued after a settlement has been successfully judged? That's a great question. So in most of the cases that we looked at for this report, we found cities issuing bonds after the fact. So um, Milwaukee, for example, is a good example. Um, every time they approved a settlement, that they needed to borrow for, there was a separate document authorizing um, bond borrowing for that settlement. And then a few months later, you could look at the OS and there was a bunch, a bunch of them together. Um, or there was a dollar amount specifically <laughs> that matched up with the amount uh, of the authorizations. Chicago um, did something very interesting in 2017 with that amount that I keep mentioning, the 225 million, they issued that 
um, we think in anticipation of using the 225 million over you know a few years out from 2017 so three or four years so they had they had said that they would no longer be issuing bonds to pay for settlements and we think that this was sort of a convenient way to stick to that um, promise by just borrowing a whole bunch in advance at once Okay. Just for time-wise, I think that's it for now. Some of the questions are more in-depth about how to do the research, tips on doing the research. Yeah, and I'll say again, um, September 2nd, we're going to do a more sort of hands-on training so that people who are really interested in looking at bond documents can do that with us. And that's it for the section. I think, yeah, there we go. I think hand it back over to Alex. I think. Cool. Um, thanks, Carrie, um, for that. And thanks, Jess. I'm having a little bit of nostalgia uh, remembering just how much fun uh, that research was, especially in Chicago in particular. <laughs> um, so we are going to talk a little bit about um, the recommendations um, so in 2018 is when we originally published our um, report on this research um, and you'll see like we had one set of recommendations and uh, again like I said earlier like we have as an organization and individuals who participated in this research definitely grown in our analysis around like what's needed what will create like the sort of police, create the police accountability and steps towards like defunding and steps towards like abolition um that you know this is like two years worth of growth here um embodied in our recommendations um and so tracy and i are just gonna talk mostly about um the 2020 recommendations uh so i'll pass to tracy to kick this off yeah thank you for that alex um and thank you i actually learned a lot from the webinar as well um our first recommendation um, is, is really simple and it's in line with what the movement is calling for now, which is defund police departments and invest in community. Um, and that's for a bunch of different reasons. One, that we know um, that police do not keep us safe. That is not a frame that we're operating in. And we know that communities have the tools that we need to keep ourselves safe. Um, and so when we look at something like um, police brutality bonds, as, as we laid out earlier, um, this the only way to stop something like this from happening is by abolishing the system. Um, and so when we look at uh, how to do that, we look at defunding um, and divesting money that is put into police and investing it into communities. Um, yes, and so our, our second recommendation um, is that if cities must borrow, um, the Federal Reserve should lend them that money without charging interest. And so not to get like too deep into it, um, but the Federal Reserve is like the central bank of the US. It has the ability to lend money. Um, it is a public, op a public option and like would, would be an alternative to borrowing from big corporate banks like Bank of America or Wells Fargo, where the, their motivation is profit, right? Which is where like the cost of issuance comes from, um, like the fees to do all of these deals, right? Like interest, um, all of these things create profit for them. And so our demand is just like that the Fed would um, lend to cities uh, without a, a motivation for profit, meaning no interest um, and no fees. And I can drop a link um, in the chat that has a little bit more about like the Fed and Fed lending. Um, and then our, our last recommendation is just that government governmental bodies at the local state and federal levels must account for and provide full transparency about the cost of policing um you know like we've alluded to chicago research was a great example of a lack of transparency um i think you know one thing in particular looking through the bond documents is chicago ha would have language in there that was like this chunk of hundreds of millions of dollars is authorized and may pay for these things. And it's a list this long of like 26, 30 things. And in there, tucked away is like, it might pay for judgments and settlements. 
and I think that you know speaks to the the pool of money that Carrie was was talking about where we don't know where it's going we don't know how much of it is being used and so again just you know more transparency around how these deals are happening um, and how much is costing us yeah and I in and I think to that point um, one of the things that we wanted to make sure that we highlighted was this idea of the total cost of policing. Alex talked about how, um, you know, sheriffs come in and do things like evict people. Um, we use police for so many things, um, and people have no idea the actual cost. So we have things that um, that they specifically hide in the budget, like city budgets will pass um, police budgets knowing that they're going to have to pay for overtime in the next budget, things like that. And so what we're saying is that folks need to be, um, to have like full transparency about what exactly we're paying for. And that's not so that we can like tinker around the edges and pay for less. It's so that people can actually understand where their money is going to. Um, I work with a group um, in Milwaukee, um, Black, who I think may be on the call. And one of the things they do is they go door to door and they ask people what would it look like for their neighborhoods to thrive. And then after they're done with the conversation, folks, you know, say everything from snow removal <laughs> to like green space. And when they're done with that conversation, they say, well, you know, part of the reason we don't have that is because we spend 40% of our city budget on policing. And people have no idea. So if we have more transparent ways to see what's in our budget, what is paid for, things like police brutality bonds, I think that we will have more people on the, um, on the road to defund. Um, and un because they understand um, where our money is being spent and how it's not contributing to community safety. Um, and before, just before we close out, I see a question that is asking if the 2020 recommendations are in addition to the 2018 recommendations um, or not instead of, I think like the difference between the, these, these two sets, the 2018 recommendations, um, we still think would be steps forward, but we were really trying to take a, like, what is the stronger step towards abolition or towards defunding or towards like true police accountability, um, especially in this moment. And like the 2020 recommendations speak to that. Um, I don't know, Carrie, if you would be um, down to speak for a couple minutes on the like liability insurance demand. Um, cause I did see a couple questions come up throughout, um, throughout this conversation and we have a little bit more time. So I think that would be helpful for folks. Sure. Um, anyone who has read the original recommendations section of the report would know that we struggled with that liability insurance, um, recommendation when we did it because, um, you know, insurance there's several reasons. One is that the insurance industry is actually part of the finance industry. And when you um, give Wall Street more power over policing uh, and more opportunity to profit, that's generally something that we are not you know, in favor of. At the time, uh, there were folks like Minneapolis in particular who were trying to get uh, police liability or individual liability insurance or police out of this sort of desperation to get uh, violent officers forced out of policing and to hold um, police departments accountable because it, you know, for years and years and years, um, as we saw uh, the cost of settlements rising and rising, nothing was changing. And like, as we saw when we were doing the research, police departments can generally just count on the city to give them more money in their budgets, no matter what they do. So, um, you know, we had, we had concerns about this recommendation at the time, but we also thought like this would be a way to reduce harm. Um, it would be a way to get violent officers off the force. We've noticed that this particular idea of individual liability insurance is picking up steam recently and we have realized that it is something that people who want to reform the police find attractive because it looks like something that you could do to keep the current policing system that we have and just make it a little less violent, which is not what we want 
at Acre. <laughs> um, as, as Alex said, we see our new recommendations more in line with um, an abolitionist agenda and setting up these additional structures like liability insurance for police could actually interfere with that rather than move us towards that. Another question that I don't know if we'll have the answer to, but folks are asking about other types of entities that have their own police forces like universities, do they issue bonds for settlements? We didn't look at that actually. <clears throat> I was gonna, I, was thinking about this um because i think the question was around like settlements um for police violence against students in schools and i think it depends on like who the issuing the bond issuing entity would be right like when the city is sued the city is who issues the bond and so in those sort of settlements where um it's police violence against students i think it depends on if it's like the school district that incurs that cost, or is it the city? Um, so, I mean, we haven't looked into that, but that is like my trail of thinking of how we might find the answer. Awesome. Do we want to share more then about um, the training and how folks can follow up following this webinar? Yeah. Um, so, Two things I think that we have, we have our contact information here. Um, I think there's a form um, that we're gonna ask folks to fill out. Um, and this, and in this form, you can indicate your interest in joining the in-depth webinar and training on bonds, like going through official statements and navigating EMMA um, at, the, at the end of the summer. And then also you'll be able to indicate your interest in attending our next webinar in our cost and capitalism series. Um, and that next webinar is on July 15th. Um, it's titled Strengthening the Demand um, or Defund the Wealthy. And we'll be talking about why we need to add um, a tax the rich frame onto our demand to defund the police. Um, and so, yeah, just if you could, if you could drop that link in the chat. Um, so, oh, yeah. A follow up email to all the attendees. I also wanted to ask you, Alex, if you can talk just a little bit about the work that ICAR is doing around policing and incarceration. There are a lot of like activity and um, conversation in the chat that are more organizing questions, not research questions. Um, yes, I think to sum up acres work right now around policing is we are trying to um, really indict racial capitalism in this moment and highlight the relationship between police and finance or police and racial capitalism again going back to like police are the muscle upholding the system that is like the reason why nurses don't have all the necessary ppe in a pandemic or like the reason that we don't have money um, to make sure that people have access to housing in a pandemic, right? Like this moment of crisis that we are in under a public health crisis and uprisings against police killing, I think is really like, it is about police violence and it is about the whole system that got us to this point in the first place. And so Acres work right now is, is working to amplify those things. And we have post email addresses like this webinar series on cops and capitalism is, is more of our external facing work right now um, to address that stuff. But I'm also happy, I will drop my email address in the chat and I'm happy to, you know, answer folks questions or talk more one on one about this stuff. Um, and if there's no more questions, um, thank you all so much. I would love if everybody could, or most folks could drop in the chat before you leave, just like one step or one thing you wanna do using this info um, that you got today. Uh, I think that would be really encouraging for us to know that it was helpful, but also like 
really inspiring um, to other folks on this call. Um, you know, this is this is collective work. So um, thanks y'all for joining. Wow, I just wanna say as folks are getting off, this is really, really dope to see all of these folks responding uh, with, with how they wanna use this information. So thank you all. It's very cool. And yeah, thank you everybody. Is there a way for us to like capture all the things that, yeah, like comments or questions? I hope there is. Yeah, we can save the chat. Um, it's just going to be like a, doc a text document. Um, I'll share that with y'all and um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. It'll help us anticipate what people want from the next one. Mm-hmm. Awesome job, y'all. I feel proud of us. <laughs> okay, I'm going to save the chat. Goodbye, everybody. I'm about to kick y'all out. Okay. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you.